Welcome back. For those who are joining online, welcome. A lot of our friends aren't able to join us in person, and we get that. Uh, some have been dealing with it or are dealing with it or high at risk, different things. And so if you're joining online, please let us know how we can continue to serve and pray for you. Those of you who are here, again, we'd like to know how we can serve and pray for you. So uh, let us know. Uh, I want to thank our volunteers and staff today. Uh, the staff, believe it or not, they didn't have a three-month vacation. They, they've been working really hard. As a matter of fact, having to learn new skills and navigate some things personally and practically. And uh, I'm, I just want to say thank you for how hard they've worked to try to keep serving you and keep helping us make more and stronger followers of Jesus Christ during this weird season. And our volunteers today all agreed to kind of fit certain um, criteria to help us uh, meet people where they are. Uh, not everybody wearing a mask today would have normally worn a mask uh, or had their temperature taken or things like that. But a lot of us who serve in, in a setting like this really listen to what Jesus said about going the extra mile from people that are disagreeing with you or sometimes different than you on perspectives. And so we've tried to take that extra mile approach. So thank you for understanding that and being part of that. And we're starting this series, uh, we started it last week, but it's called Best Summer Ever. Now, it doesn't feel like we're off to the best summer ever, if you ask me, but the thing is, we're studying this book, Philippians. It's in the New Testament. And if you have a Bible, you can turn to Philippians. If you don't know where it is in the Bible, the very first book of the Bible is called The Table of Contents, and it'll tell you. It'll show you where it is. But Philippians was this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in Philippi. And it's a very strategic church. It's a very important letter. It's actually one of my favorite books of the Bible. It may have helped me in more seasons of life than any other book. But Paul was writing to them, the Philippians, while he was in quarantine. It wasn't just quarantine, he was in jail for a long time to make our quarantine period or stay-at-home period look like a cakewalk. He was in there for multiple years. And he had always dreamed of going to Rome as a preacher, and instead he went as a prisoner, and he was locked up for a long time. But out of that, he writes to the Philippians, and there's some insights in how we could really have the best summer ever, even have best days ever. And the question, as I was reading this, preparing for this series, I was also reading this book called The Splendid and the Vile. Has anybody read that, or is anybody reading that? And Mark and I are reading it together. So anyway, uh, it, it's great. It's about Winston Churchill, who was the prime minister of, of uh, Great Britain, the first year of his prime, being prime minister, which was during World War II. His first day as prime minister, uh, the, the Nazis invaded Holland and Belgium. Day one on the job. Manage that. And that doesn't seem like those are other countries. doesn't seem like a big deal. But the Nazis kept getting closer and closer and closer to England. As a matter of fact, he had to manage 57 straight days of bombings of the city. It was intense. It was pressure-packed. Lots of different opinions about how they should manage it, how they should navigate it what we should do, and how will we stop. Everyone thought invasion of England was imminent by the Nazis, and a lot of people really believed that England wouldn't even survive. And the point that Eric Larson does, and I didn't figure it out until about a third way through the book, I go, this is interesting, but I'm not sure exactly what I'm supposed to do with all this. But I went back and I looked at a note to the reader at the beginning, and he says, in particular, I thought about Winston Churchill. How did he withstand it? How did he survive? How do you go through all that pressure, all those challenges, as a prime minister, as a husband, as a dad, as a friend, just as a person, how do you navigate all this pressure? And he gives a lot of insights and in some of the strategies that Churchill had for dealing with, with, with some of the challenges, pressures, and leadership things. I've actually incorporated some of his principles for uh, managing stress. But anyway, like that's what I was reading about Churchill. And at the same time, I'm reading Philippians. I'm like, actually, how did Paul survive it? Paul was shipwrecked, bitten by a snake, thrown in jail, racially profiled, um, a, a physically abused, um, people would go right after he would teach somebody and there'd be a big success. Somebody else would come and say, don't listen to anything he said, he's wrong. Like everything was, was just so challenging for Paul. How in the world did he survive it? It's a great question because one of the things, the insights that I think we're going to get from this as we read through Philippians is Paul was able, my question was this, how was Paul able to find such joy? Joy is a key word in the book of Philippians. How is he able to find peace? Peace is a theme that runs through it. Contentment. How is he able to have perseverance and confidence when everything seemed to be going wrong? How did he do it? 
Well, I, I, I kind of got me asking the question, what if the key to having the best summer ever has well, what Paul discovered less to do with what happens to you and more about these secrets that he found that he shares with his friends in Philippi as he writes in this letter? And as you read Philippians, in Philippians 1, it kind of starts off, it's a letter to Philippi from Paul. It's a few more words than that, but basically that's what it is. It's a letter. And it's a, it's a letter from prison. They're concerned for him. They're like, Paul, sure looks like things aren't going well. They're concerned because they were really, really good friends with him. And Paul's writing them to say thank you. You guys have partnered with me and invested in me and been able to do what I'm doing. And if you're afraid now that, that God's not able to keep working because I'm in prison, I, I want to tell you why I believe he can. And he writes all these insights that even though it was written to them, there's something here for us. There's something here for you as you read through Philippians. And it all started 10 years earlier. Last week we read Acts chapter 16 about Paul went to Philippi. And 10 years earlier, that all happened. And this is written 10 years later as Paul is writing them to say thank you. With, and not just to say thank you, but to give them some key insights into how to navigate challenging situations. And Paul wants something for them. That's why he writes the letter. He wants something for you. He wants something for you. He wants something for me. There's something here for you. And in verse 3, he says this. <clears throat> Talking about them. I thank my God every time I remember you. Like, he was grateful for them. It's a thank you note. In all my prayers for all of you, he prayed for them. He wasn't just like, I feel thankful for them. Like, he prayed diligently for them. I always pray with joy. That word shows up so many times. Joy, rejoice, rejoicing. It shows up again and again and again. He had joy, even though life might have led most of us to think there shouldn't be. He had joy because of their partnership in the gospel from the first day, 10 years ago, Acts chapter 16, until now. And then there's this very famous verse. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And Paul has this confidence that God started something, that it's a good work, and he'll carry it on to completion. And he was confident in that. He was so confident. He believed that to be true. Whether he was in jail or out of jail. Whatever was going on them, he was confident. For them, the Philippians, he said, I've seen something. I'm confident that God started something in you and he's going to finish it. And he's done it with me and he's going to finish it. That was his confidence. And Paul knew something that was helpful when things aren't going well. Or when you think you're stuck. Paul knew that he could trust God to finish what he started. And for many of us, we may have read that verse before, memorized that verse, quoted that verse. It's a great verse. It's got a great promise. But it could be one of the most misapplied verses. It, it really could. And what happens is there's this idea of reading things in context to understand what it means. And it's this key word right here, partnership. He was confident because he believed all this to be true, but he knew it to be true because he saw it because of their partnership. There was this connection. In this verse, it's important to look at what it says versus what we wish it said. I wish it said, God's going to finish what he started and I don't have to do anything. Like every day, it's just like new operating system. Push the button and it's downloaded and I'm good to go. There's something required of us. It's this word partnership. And Paul said, that's not just, there, there's this process, which I'm thankful for. Many of us quoted this verse this way. Hey, I'm a work in progress, so I'm sorry I just said that to you in that meeting. Whoops, God's still got some work to do. Sometimes we misapply it that way. No, that doesn't excuse being a jerk to somebody. It doesn't excuse being unforgiving. No, God still has work to do, but it requires us to take steps of obedience. But God's the one who does the heavy lifting. God's doing a good work, and he'll finish it. But there is this process but there was also this fruit that was evident. There was progress that he saw. He goes, I've seen it the first day. It wasn't there. And now I see it. And here's the truth. I hope you really believe this. That if the living God, our living hope, is living his life in us and through us, it'll change us. How could it not? It'll change us. And Paul saw that process and progress because of this partnership. This word partnership is a Greek word, koinonia. The Bible was written in the language of, of, of Greek. 
And when we translate it into English, it can show up a lot of different ways. Here, it's the word partnership, koinonia, same Greek word that we see in chapter 2, Philippians 2, verse 1. So here is a partnership between God, I mean Paul and the Philippian church. Here it says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any, here's, it's translated common sharing in the spirit. So this isn't between Paul and the Philippian church. This is between the Philippian church and the spirit with God. This word koinonia, this fellowship, partnership, participation, community, it's a verse that has application between us and God, our relationship there, and our relationship between us and each other. And both of those are part of the process of how God changes us, where we see the progress of God making us more like him. It's the same word, koinonia. It shows up, he uses it three times in Philippians. It's 19 times in the New, Ta- uh, New Testament in 17 dis- different verses. Three of them are in Philippians. The next was in chapter three. I want to know Christ. He has to know the power of his resurrection, right? Like we sang, he's our living hope. I want to experience the power of the resurrection. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead, God says is living in you and through you through his Holy Spirit. I want to know that. And participation in his sufferings. Well, I don't know about that. I want the first part. I like that part, the power of his resurrection. Paul counted it a privilege. Someone beat him because he followed Jesus. He said, that's a win. I don't view it that way. Someone ridicules him because of his faith. Someone challenges his faith. He's like, hey, the gospel of God's not mine. I'm just telling about it. Here, I, I, when I participate in his sufferings, that's the same word, a fellowship, a relationship with his sufferings, a partnership by suffering, a participation. There's a community there with God because I'm going through some of the things that he went through. He said there's something about that, this can partnership, that changes us. And it shows the progress. It shows the fruit. It's the same verse used earlier in the book of Acts when it talks about the first followers of Jesus, about how they were becoming more and more like Jesus as disciples. And disciples weren't just 12 guys who sat at the Last Supper and one of them got the boot. Like 12 disciples are anyone who follows Jesus and is a learner of Jesus, the early Christ followers. This is what described them in Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, so they, they studied what, the, what Jesus taught, and to fellowship, same word, koinonia, fellowship, partnership, participation, community, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Like, that's what they did. As a matter of fact, the early church didn't exist in a building like this. It exi- existed in houses. And Phil- the Philipp- uh, Philippian church, when Paul was writing this letter, they may not have been bigger than Live Oak. They may not have been bigger than this room right here, which is at best half full. Like, is it half full or half empty? Like, are you, like is it, you know, when someone gives you a glass of water, is it half full or half empty? I just said, I, I ordered a sweet tea. That's not my order. So anyway, I'm, I'm, some are a pessimist, some are optimist. I'm just a difficult person. But so, so like this, this building, like right now, I, I don't know how many are in the room, 150, less than that. The Philippian church was probably smaller than that. As a matter of fact, the Philippian church might have been about the size of some of our larger small groups at Live Oak. Like, they were small, but they had a big impact. Their partnership, you know, in in Acts, it started in Jerusalem with these people that were gathering in homes, and then it kind of spread throughout the world. There was this fellowship, this fellowship, partnership, participation with each other and with God, and it changed them, and it really changed the world. Paul writes about how the Philippian church partnered with him later, and this is, if you have a Bible, turn to Philippians chapter 4. Yes, it was good for you to share. There was a partnership there in my troubles. They didn't just send a check. They were fully invested in his life. And they put themselves in harm's way as followers of Jesus and supporters of Paul. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days, Acts chapter 16, 10 years earlier, when Paul goes to to Philippi and he Lydia follows Jesus, the first follower of Jesus in Philippi. And then the Philippian jailer says yes to following Jesus and his whole family follows. He goes, in the early days, when I set out for Macedonia, for Macedonia, not one church shared with me. He had nobody partnering with him. In the matter of giving and receiving, there was a financial investment, except for you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. They were, resp- like, they were responsive to the needs they saw. 
for the Apostle Paul. They were partners. They were invested. That's why I love that Mark talked about how we celebrated being able to partner with a lot of different organizations and agencies and churches who are really doing good stuff right now that had need. We were able to do that because you partnered with Live Oak, and Live Oak partnered with them really well. There's something about that process that at one, it changes us to become more like Christ as we surrender to serve and be obedient to what he asks, but it also shows the progress, the fruit of how God has grown us. So Paul wrote this letter, Philippians, to them. And, and we get to read it. It wasn't written to us. This was their mail. It, when I read Philippians chapter 1, it says, uh, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. It doesn't say to Doug. It wasn't written to me. As a matter of fact, I don't know how many of us, if we had a map right now, could even show where Philippi was. I mean, that's how this far we are after this. It wasn't written to us, but here's the thing we know about the Bible. It was written for us. And when we read their mail, there's some things that, well, that really doesn't apply to us. Like, I don't think God will ever ask you to go build an ark. That was something to Noah, right? So you, how do you sort out what's to us and what was just for them? It wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. When we read somebody else's mail, especially these, these letters like, like, that Paul wrote, the first thing you want to ask is, what did it mean for them? Like for the Philippians, this gives us insight. Paul is thanking them for sharing in, their, in this partnership. It's a key word, partnership, that comes up a lot. Sharing comes up a lot. He was thanking them. So what did it mean for them? But then you always ask, how does it apply to me now? How does it apply to me now? So if you look at Philippians 1.6, you can't take this out of context of the whole letter because you might miss something. You could read this and say, well, I've got an excuse because I was a jerk today because God hasn't finished what he started. God's still got some work to do. Rather than leaning in and saying, I messed up, I need to confess that, I need to realize I was disrespectful to somebody. Or we can think, all I gotta do is just kind of let God download something into me and just kind of be patient as he's doing the work. Come on, Jesus, pick it up. You got work to do. Good, so get going. When you read it in its context with what happened before was about partnership and, and, and throughout the Bible, God does the work. He changes us from the inside out. But it requires my participation. He will not force this upon me, but he will invite me to be a part of it. And my confidence is in Christ not in my ability to change my life. But my confidence comes from my connection to Christ and to others as God uses all of that, even my difficult situations, to change me. The weird thing about human nature is we shy away from difficulty. We, we, we kind of avoid things that are uncomfortable. God probably did some of his best work in Paul when he was very, very uncomfortable. God will do some of his best work in you when you're very, very uncomfortable. So be careful about trying to find the path of least resistance. Be careful about trying to remove all discomfort from your life because God says, you're throwing out some great tools right now. As a matter of fact, if you think about partnership and community and fellowship, which by the way, fellowship has less to do with potluck suppers and more to do about deep relationships with Lots of different types of people. The early church was at its best when it was struggling to figure out how do I follow Jesus with someone who's so different than me? Jews and Gentiles coming together. I mean, stomachs were being nauseated at some meals because how the Gentiles were eating the Jewish tradition. Like, trying to figure out how do we follow Jesus with grace, but also all this stuff going on. Read Acts chapter 15. It's a fascinating chapter as they try to navigate that. But if your fellowship, if your community is all people who just look like you and act like you and they're the people that aren't difficult for you, it's hard to do the one another's of forgive one another if there's no one in your life that you'd ever feel like you need to forgive. Like it's hard to be patient with one another if you surround yourself with people who are just, they're pretty easy folks. God, Jesus went to the most difficult people 
And then he won another them. He loved them. And then he told us, love others the way I have loved you. Like, be careful about trying to arrange your life, especially your relational world, around just having your, your inner circle be people that are they're easy for me. Because the partnership, the fellowship, the participation, that changes us, and application happens there. But in all of that, there was this verse that's so important. As a matter of fact, it's, on your, it's the Live Oak memory verse for the week. That we can be confident that God began something, a good work. It's very, very good. And he will carry it on to completion. That's his part in this. My question is to figure out what's mine. But here's what Paul knew. This was his confidence. I can trust God to finish what he started. If you feel like you're stuck, if you feel like there's something in the path between you and where God's trying to lead you, God can finish what he started. God can finish what he started. He's promised to do it. The only question is, will I participate? On his terms, not mine. The question is, am I partnering with Jesus? Am I participating with what he's doing and the path he's leading me down? Paul goes on to describe how much he loved these people he's writing this letter to as we read their mail and figure out what does it mean for us. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you. He loved them so much. Since I have you in my heart. And then he says this very important phrase, whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel. He says, I'm in jail. But I still love you. I know that you're with me. And I still believe God's doing what he promised. God's not, God can't be stopped. Nothing stops God from working. And he was writing in chains. He wasn't free. And he said, here's what I love about you guys. All of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul said, something happened to me that day in my life that you can read about in, in Acts where he went from being someone who was trying to imprison Christians and kill Christians and stop the church. And one day he's knocked off his horse and, and all of a sudden, he see, has this interaction with Jesus that changes him. And then the rest of the book of Acts is Paul going to church, to church, to church, excuse me, from city to city to city, starting these churches, being thrown in prison, being beaten up, shipwrecked, bitten by a snake, and all this stuff happens. And we think, man, Paul had a 180. He went from hating God to loving God, and nothing can stop him. But what's lost is when you turn one page in Acts, it's about a decade of time of God using different circumstances and Paul participating with others to be discipled and to learn and to grow and to become the person that God would use for the rest of the book of Acts. See, God's not finished with you yet. There's a process. And he, for all of us, he's got work to do, some more than others. But there's a process he's committed to. Am I? Am I committed to it? So much to the point where I'm willing to share in what God's doing and showing grace to people that I don't think deserve it? Am I willing to do it in sharing grace and, 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 and investing in someone who by just supporting them could get me thrown in prison? I mean, there's all these things in their life and why he loved them so much. But back to verse 6. This is the key verse. That Yeah, don't take it out of context, but don't miss it. I can trust God to finish what he started. I can be confident that God started something. It's a good work and he'll finish it, and he'll finish till the very end. Paul was confident that Christ was working in him and through them, in them, the Philippians. And he said, because I see that process, and because I'm seeing progress, I know, I can see God's fingerprints that he's at work. Do you see God's progress in you? Because he promised he's going to keep working and moving you forward to become more and more like him. So if you're participating, you'll see the progress. Celebrate it. And celebrate it for what it is. It's God's good work, not mine. But it does require my participation. And in two weeks, we'll talk about this. Paul knew that nothing stops God from working. He knew it. This week, what I want to challenge you to do is to dig in Philippians, to read their mail. Read it at whatever pace you want. It's only four chapters. It's not very long. Some of you are doing the YouVersion uh, Bible plan reading uh, plan for Philippians called Choosing Joy. Uh, man, engage in there and read it through. Think about what it says. Ask about what did it mean then, but what is it, how does it apply now? And as you do that and read and reflect and respond to Scripture, ask yourself 
What am I going to do this week to partner with others? Who am I going to reach out to and, and, and invest in like the way they invested in Paul or the way Paul invested in them? Ask, how can I participate with what God is doing in the world and in my life this week? He is committed to your spiritual growth. Are you? He's the one that does the work, but it requires me to step into what he's doing. And what will you do this week to participate in the process for God to make prog- pro- progress in you? Be practical. Be specific. But realize that everything that happens to you this week, God says, I can use that. I can use that. I can use that for my purpose to make you more like me. It's a good work, and he's committed to carry it on to completion. Let's pray together. God, thanks that you love us. Thanks that you're for us, and you're committed to our spiritual growth. It's a good work, and it's yours. But you've invited us to participate. Lord, help us to do that. Give us wisdom of what that looks like. And in those difficult moments or with difficult people, this week, help us to figure out what it would look like to be in fellowship with you and with them to respond the way you would in those relationships. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.